Hi, and welcome to Second Rate Film School. I'm Andrew, and today we have another special guest, William Sanderson, best known for um, TV's Newhart, True Blood, Deadwood, Coach, Jumanji, The Rocketeer, Blade Runner, and a ton of other stuff. His IMDb is um, probably a longer than my arm if you printed it out, so you've had quite the career, so welcome. Thank you, and uh, I feel very lucky and uh, uh, not to get ahead of you, but I even got a book finished, so I hope I, you'll allow me to mention it later. Yeah, and I'll uh, make sure to put the link in the description down below. I know I'm actually going to probably pick up a copy now on um, Black Friday because it um, sounds pretty interesting. You know, you've had quite the career, and we will obviously get into it. Well, uh, as my wife reminds me, I always had help. Exactly. Especially with the book. So, obviously you've had quite the career, and we'll touch on it a lot, but um, here today we're going to be focusing a lot on Newhart. Um, you played the character of Larry. Across the eight seasons, you appeared in 91 of the 184 episodes, so about half the episodes. So you guys were um, pretty high up there in appearances compared to some of the other um, cast members. Um, I have my like little list cheat sheet here. The characters Chester and Jim only appeared in the um, mid to high 30s. Officer Shitlet only appeared 20 times and Harley appeared 16 times. So you guys really were fan favorites, obviously. So what was that like considering that was only supposed to be a one-off role for you guys originally? Well, obviously it was a big surprise and uh, they kept adding episodes. So that made it rewarding but it also the fact that you're not there every week allowed me to do some things outside where if I had to be there every week I couldn't do them uh, you know and if they let you go in the middle of the week and say you got to be back by Friday uh, and then they tell you you know it costs half a million dollars and if you don't show up they put that pressure on but all I'm saying in a long-winded way is it worked great to be on a substantial number of times, but also to have uh, free time to do other shows. Well, and it's actually interesting because, and that was bring me to my next question, when I um, interviewed um, John Volstead, link below for the, you guys who haven't watched it yet, um, you know, he mentioned he wasn't really aware of this, but, you know, the vast majority of your appearances, really, or the number, I should say, really kicked off in season three when you guys took over the Minuteman Cafe after um, the character of Kirk left. Do you know if they were going to be trying to find a way to um, boost up your appearance numbers regardless, or was that just a happy coincidence of, well, we have this set, the guy who owned it left town, so we got to find someone to own it? Well, I, I was on a... Need to know basis, which is, I usually am <laughs> most of my career. But uh, uh, Stephen Campman was a nice man, and uh, I'm sorry he he left. He even recommended that we come in. That he recommended that the Larry Daryl and Daryl come in for a wedding or something, and you know that shows what kind of guy he was. And then to lose the job, uh, I must have felt awful, but um, I heard he's a great writer, and uh, another young actress, Jennifer Holmes, uh, she started out, she was good, but they said she was too perfect, so it's, uh, it's rolling dice, and that on that show, they kept us around for some reason. Yeah, well, and yeah, that's the thing. I mean, I mentioned again with John, we briefly talk about the departure of the two of them. And I mean, I really like the Kirk character. I think he could have worked for the remainder of the series. But yeah, I think um, with Jennifer Holmes, they made the mistake of, yeah, she was like too perfect of a character. They didn't really give her what we later saw with um, the Stephanie yeah. character of, you know, what is she doing? She was always actually doing her job. The gimmick was she was rich, but you know, they were both good actors. And it is sad to see him go, but, you know, you guys got to stick around, so. So, yeah, so you guys appeared in, you know, 91 of the 184 episodes, but, you know, even though that's a little less than half, you know, whenever people talk about Newhart, you know, you guys are usually mentioned top of the list. You know, I know re-watching this show with my parents, my dad's always like, we need more Larry, Daryl, and Daryl. Find those episodes. We need to watch those ones. You know, the, you guys were their favorite characters. Nice to hear, uh, but I guess. Bob Newhart ran everything, and he wanted to keep a mystery about it. And uh, you know, it's, it's frustrating at times because uh, I'd 
thought we had more to offer, but uh, I was very happy. It's it's even a joy to go on and have a, at least quasi career in spite of being remembered on a sitcom. You have to overcome that. I mean, it didn't hurt Tom Hanks, but in general, you know, I've sat in interviews where casting directors talking to the director said, you may not want to hire him. He was on the New Heart show. Well, he did hire me, and he said, I saw a deal. I've never seen that show. Uh, he's a wonderful guy, but, you know, there's a stereotype. And uh, I was able to survive. Exactly. Well, that's the thing, you know, getting a little bit ahead of ourselves into some of your other roles, you know, your role of Larry, um, you know, I know it came a little before, you know, did a great job on um, the 80s Twilight Zone. I just actually rewatched that one recently, um, just trying to rewatch that show. Much different role than you get into later on, you know, the character of Sheriff Bud on True Blood and, you know, EB on Deadwood are two very different types of characters. And, you know, it's, you swing, you're able to swing through it. Very great writers, you know, we speak of the right starts of the writing. And we had David Milch, who taught English literature at Yale on Deadwood. And we had Alan Ball, who won an Academy Award himself, but for, I believe, American Beauty, who created uh, True Blood. So I was fortunate. You know the phrase, many are called, but few are chosen. I'm glad I was chosen. <laughs> We're glad to didn't, didn't do it. Didn't do every episode. On Deadwood, I didn't do every episode. So, you know, I love David Mills. Yeah. Um, so, again, you know, with Newhart, though, you know, obviously everyone talk like the one thing that people generally talk about that show is the legendary series finale. So, when did you find out that it was going to be, you know, the reveal to be a dream of the Bob Newhart show? No, oh, I didn't know how that was going to end, you know. That's a total surprise. And the uh, audience went crazy with laughter. But uh, I don't know how Mary Fran truly thought about it, but she probably acquiesced in having Su- uh, uh, Su- Susan Plichette, Susan Plichette, who was great. Both of them are Really good. Yeah, I heard that Mary Fran was initially um, a little hesitant about it, worrying that it could be potentially insulting to the fans, kind of like poking fun, like, hey, uh, none of this mattered. But in the end, I think that's like the perfect send off to that show. You know, the finale is just so wacky. All of um, you guys getting bought up by the Japanese um, business firm and all that. And, you know, Larry or Daryl mm-hmm. and Daryl finally talking, you guys all becoming mega rich. And you it know, just. But there's one thing a producer saddled up to me one day. And he said, you know, you're more secure than Mary Fran. And that, that you know, character actor didn't hear that too much. <laughs> you know? It made me feel good. You know, why? See, Mary had a hard job. She took over, and Suzanne Plushet was loved and, and a great character. So uh, the, all the time, uh, one person said Mary Fran's character was to get from A to B. I, I wouldn't even talk like this, probably if people were alive or if I weren't approaching death myself. But I like having the producer tell me that, yeah. And people act up, we act up. And, uh, he might, one of them might have come up to her and said the same thing. You know, you're a lot more secure than William Sanders. What does that have to do with anything? The only thing is... I'm tired of apologizing all the time. Yeah. Well, I mean, still, that's very interesting to hear, and I can imagine, you know, like you said, as a character actor, hearing that um, made you feel pretty secure in the, oh, we're going to definitely be coming back here more often. I was going to say, you know, with Mary Fran, um, you know, yeah, obviously, yeah, she did have the difficult shoes to fill because, yeah, you did have wacky people in the original Bob Newhart show, but, you know, for several seasons, people saw Bob Newhart and Susan Pluchette you know, for her to then have to come in and fill that, you know, the loving ro- wife role, even though it was a different type of character, technically, just personality-wise. Um, she did a great job, and, like, all of them, like, all of you, you know, Tom Poston, um, Peter Scalaria, Julia Duffy, obviously Bob Newhart, um, all of you guys, like, were just really, like, firing on all cylinders, all eight seasons of this show. Um, 
you know, the first episode to the last episode, I think are just as high quality. So it really stands to the testament of you guys as actors and actresses and the writers in general. And Bob, please yeah. tune in to see Bob. I don't want to forget, but thank you for saying that. Uh, and Mary Fran, I really liked her. Uh, and I don't think we had any problems, you know, but uh, what was I in? And I didn't have any problems that I knew of with the other ones, but I was playing the town crazy, so to speak. So, you know, I don't know what they really thought, but uh, is this a family show, so to speak? Yeah, you can say whatever you want. Uh, my viewership is usually and aging you can enough. cut it if you don't like it. Yeah, sure. I was in the Hard Rock Cafe and the bartender brought me a note and uh, I looked at it and it said, have you ever seen Mary Fran's breast? And um, I haven't. And But it was a customer. Made me laugh, you know. And obviously, he watched the New Heart show and she wore beautiful uh, sweaters. Well, of course you shared a great number of scenes with your various other cast members, you know, Bob Newhart, Mary Fran, Tom, Peter Scolari, Julia, uh, etc. The ones you obviously spent the most amount of time, I think would be a fair assessment to say, is your brother Daryl and your other brother Daryl, you know, Tony and John. What was working with the two of them like? I, John and Tony were two. I said to someone on the interview, I don't know if I could have done it with anybody else because they put their egos aside and they knew more about acting than I did. Tony had done a hundred plays. John studied in England. I learned from both of them, but they, uh, and, and sometimes I, I'm sure I did some stupid lame things and they would, uh, they were forgiving. <laughs> yeah. I didn't try to, it's just, I'm doing the talking, so I get the credit. Or they come to the press, and they uh, the press wants to talk to me. But they 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 like for, they would they ever want the brothers to do a commercial. They end up, I mean, um, uh, oh, I forget a big commercial. They don't, but MTM wouldn't let them. So uh, I just didn't think I, it's it's sad. You know, MTM owns the characters, and I got to do a commercial. It was ran for three years or so, and uh, I was in an awkward position, but because of their integrity and character, we survived. Yeah, and that's um, interesting because, again, yeah, I was talking with John a little bit about this, that, you know, unlike most other actors, you know, you guys like, were usually when you were doing these interviews, especially obviously when the show was on, were expected to be in character. So that had to be, you know, tough for them that they can't come out and be like, oh, no, we can talk. Really and hard. Yeah. yeah. Really hard for them. Yeah, we did the morning shows back in New York, and uh, I didn't think it, but, uh, you know, I'm just a character actor, and that's what the book is about. So. Go ahead, please. Yeah, so, I mean, very, you know, and it, again, shows how great all three of you guys are that, I mean, obviously you got to play off great writing, play off, you know, people like Bob or Mary Fran, um, and et cetera, but, like, the three of you guys, you know, constantly are just, like, a sources of hilarity. Like, they're, you know, um, John was, like, saying, you know, we would, you know, like, shrug, you know, empathetically, I believe is how he phrased it. Like, you, know, you could get a lot of acting from the two of them out of it to play off of you as well and all that that you guys you know, were like really always well, you know, doing great they're very good at it and they're very different characters i ran for mayor and john my other brother daryl voted for me but tony would never have voted for me so they have a whole different life and uh i didn't speak in a movie called the client with uh, Susan Sarandon, that was because Tommy Lee Jones didn't want me to, but it's not easy to yep. go through a whole picture, you know, and uh, I kept the money, but it's, I'm very fond of the brothers, yeah. don't, don't just tell them, tell them, he said both of you drank too much, and he had to prop you up, blah, 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 but they know how I feel about them. Yeah. No, and it's it's nice to hear that again. You guys like form a friendship. You know, you can you hear a lot of times these sitcoms. Not going to name names, but you hear about people who are like, 
to them, it was just a nine to five. Their coworker, they, the cast members were just coworkers, and that was it. And you like, you're like, oh, you know, you wish character A and character B could be friends, but to hear that you guys, you know, like each other and friendship and all that's um, again very heartwarming to hear. We were like real brothers, so inevitably there were tensions that I didn't even know about, and I did some dumb things. We traveled around the country, New York and Vermont, and San Francisco. Parted down in our own way. And I was in the limo with John and Tony, and they were giving us, a, or we were presenting an award. And this drunk comes running up, and I didn't see him, but Tony jumped out of the car and stopped him. What does that have to do? It's just, it was a very sweet thing to say. I think John was in the car, but Tony probably protected me. They, the drunk didn't like us because we were in a limo and all of us worked 10 years before we made a living. Act. They thought we started at the top and stayed there. Mm-hmm. It's hard to do. Hard See to what be- I'm talking about? I just started babbling. Yeah, no, it's, it's an interesting story. I mean, hard to believe that anyone want to attack you, but hey, look, you know, someone pun- just sucker punched Rick Moranis, so there are just people out there who don't like actors for yeah, some reason. Yeah, I've read about that. Okay. I was there over six years, but nothing like it is now. Your home originally is, if you don't mind me asking. Um, Buffalo, New York. Oh, right, right. I think David Milch is from that area. I did the creator of Deadwood. I know um, um, Jeffrey Jones, who was also in Deadwood, um, was oh, um, from Buffalo. Jeffrey, I, I love Jeffrey. Yeah. Can I tell a story about Jeffrey? Sure. Uh, he, uh, I said, I want you to direct me in a play. And I, I liked him a lot, his acting. But one day, we were shooting a scene in the thoroughfare, big crowd, and uh, he slapped me as he thought the character was, would do his character. And he's about 6'4", 240, 250. So I slapped him back three or four times like a woman. And... Uh, one of the stars jumped in, whoa, whoa, hey, hey, hey. And I felt so bad. I felt terrible. I sent him a bottle of wine. I wrote him a note uh, the next day, and he was very gracious, never held it against me. But I came out of character, and his was in character. So then I told Ian McShane, who liked me a little bit, I said, Ian, uh, it was in character. He's like, man, I said, he said, it always is, it always is. <laughs> it would make the excuse that it is. Luckily, Jeffrey didn't uh, pick me up and drop me. Yeah. Hell, I, I loved him. He's a wonderful actor. Yeah, yeah. and I mean, the, you know, obviously you've been focusing on um, New Heart, but yeah, I mean, the cast in all those shows, True Blood, Deadwood, um, all of them were, you know, like, again, great, you know, actors actresses you know in their own right and you know it's it's you know like hey go show you hbo can uh, get some pretty good actors yeah and i didn't mention from timothy oliphant to ian mcshane to molly parker to uh oh i can't list them all brad Dourif, uh and uh, trixie uh, i'm using her character name but and we had great guest stars uh, but uh now, rounding back a little bit, you know, you talk about um, all the, across the different shows you've worked on and all the tons of different actors you've worked with, um, you know, like with the story you told about um, Jeffrey um, smacking you on Deadwood. Um, a lot of actors are known to, like, insert, you know, quirky things to their characters to, you know, improve upon and flesh out the characters. Now, John told me about an interesting thing that you did while we were doing our commentary tracks that um, I'd like to have you elaborate on if you can. Um that you would always have a quarter tucked behind your ear while you were playing Larry. Um, can you um, go into the origins of that a little bit? Yeah, yeah, that's proof that I only thought it was a one-time thing. And, pardon me for dropping the name, but in Coal Miners of Order, I'm selling moonshine, and I had looked in the book since it's taken place in the 40s, and People, certain people, especially rural Southerners, put a coin in their ear. Could be half a dollar. I put a quarter. I've seen pictures of them with a penny, and I did it for good luck. So when I went into Newhart, 
most people didn't know it was there. Uh, we just never mentioned it. I hope they didn't think it was a hearing aid. But, uh, you know, it worked once. Is, uh, Tony Papenfuss used to talk about why did George Foreman name six of his kids George? And uh, I think George Foreman said, well, it worked once. <laughs> <laughs> that it's, uh, yeah, yeah, another silly choice. Yeah, it's just an interesting thing, and it goes into showing, like, the weird quirks of Larry and the Daryls that just, like, you know, every time you feel like you got like a beat on them, that you know what's finally going on with them, go, nope, we're going to pull a new layer back in. You know, other brother Daryl was a, you know, was a model at one point, or that Johnny Carson is paying your bills. Yeah. Yeah, that was interesting. But they also played the piano, didn't they, in an episode? Yeah. And so that's something I'm glad they didn't ask me to do. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, yeah, it was always, that's always just the fun thing with your guys' characters that like just every new episode just brings something weird and um, wonderful. Like you said, you know, in that episode, you you run for mayor, and then you find out that apparently your politics differ from Daryl, and it's just it's just great. Um, you had the line, you know, which one of you is a Benedict Daryl? Like you know, one of your brothers betrayed you, but you're not sure which one initially. Um, you know, in the one commentary track that um, me and John did, we did um, the Prodigal Daryl, the one where you guys write the um, jingle, like the really inane jingle, but somehow you win 30 grand for it. I wish I could recall like you do, but they asked us one time, well, what's one of your favorite shows? And I said, the Prodigal Daryl was one. But I thought it had some humanity, you know. But Tony said, oh. You like it when I'm off screen most of the time, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but he, he's a uh, he's a very funny guy. Both of them are in oh, real yeah. life. Yeah, no, and again, it shows like you know just a testament to like you know being able to be nonverbal, like all of their like you know shrugs and like their looks, and then that episode you know it ends with you know um, Daryl, you know Tony's Daryl blew the money that he got. And you have the final line you have is like, Well, Daryl, you blew $5,000 in three days. I hope it was worth it. And then he just gives like a devilish smile. And that's how like the episode ends. It's like perfect to see the usually stoic Daryl like have the mischievous laugh. And you can tell exactly what he did like on that smile and all that. Yeah. yeah. You're, you're aware that they both worked at this fairly exclusive theater of Mark Taper for long in LA. Yeah. And the casting director knew them from there. They, we may have all read for Larry, and I'm sure that uh, either one of them could have played Larry, but I got lucky. You know, John was like saying that he loves it, loved playing um, Daryl, or other brother Daryl, and um, I'm sure that never got confusing on set, um, but um, yeah, that again, you guys all, and you, you know, obviously Larry would get the majority of the lion's share of the um, solo episodes, of, or the episodes um, featuring you guys specifically, but you know, each of them got their own spotlight episodes. Um, John, obviously, in um, season seven's This Blood's for You, that's the one where uh, they give, he gives Stephanie his blood for like a transfusion, and it's like a very nice moment at the end where she's initially horrified that, you know, she has part of you guys in her, but like, you know, he, it's a yeah. very nice acting moment with the two of them. Yeah, they could have done, uh, I hate to talk like that, but could have done so much more now. Maybe, I believe we got a chunk of money when the series ended for the option to do a spinoff, but the company ran out of money. And it may have been better because if I, do it too long, I probably wouldn't get to do much else. But uh, I just always thought, when you think of the other comedic groups, there was just a ton of more more stuff they could have done. Yeah. And uh, I don't know. I was I was on the Paley the Paley uh, the thing they have in L.A. and they were celebrating Bob and his shows going on Hulu, our show. And then somebody in the audience said, how many shows did you do? And I said, not enough. And I, I didn't mean it disrespectfully or anything. It's, uh, uh, it's never enough. It's never enough. But I'm, I'm very happy.
happy the way things have turned out with my so-called life and I hope that uh, someone reads the book. It's called, Yes, I'm That Guy, The Rough and Tumble Life of a Character Actor. Surviving over 40 years in Hollywood, sixth grade in New York, Army and law school, blah, blah, blah. Um, continuing on, so, you know, we briefly talked about, you know, you liked um, working with Mary F- Fran and all that. Do you have any um, fun stories about any of the other cast members you'd like to share, you know, over the course of eight years working with? Oh, you know, that's when I miss John and Tony because they remembered the funny stuff. I, Newhart told me I was too, put too much pressure at trying to take myself too seriously instead of just having fun like Tom Post. I, I like Peter Scolari, uh, he was in North Carolina somewhere, and um, he said, uh, somebody said, boy, that guy must be very dumb, he plays Larry, and he said, Peter told me, he replied, well, I don't know, he has a lot of grief, but if we would do that, Peter, they would say to me, somebody said once, and it didn't, uh, Peter Scolari's character is kind of nerdish. And I said, well, I don't know. He's a heck of an athlete. He's a dad. He's, he's a professional to work with. So I don't know what the others said. They might have said I spit my tobacco in a coffee cup. <laughs> but we, I think we, uh, we were lucky to have, Bob didn't allow nonsense. If they got too big, he just, they wouldn't be back, you know. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing. It's, it just shows, you know, the testament to how loved your characters were that, again, you were only supposed to be in that one episode. And, you know, when that was one of the other episodes that me and John talked about, you know, it was the second episode of the series. And you don't appear until like the last three minutes, I think, of the show when all is said and done are you know, or barely there. But it shows like how quickly you became, you know, fan favorites. That's like, we got to keep you coming back. So, you know, that also probably played a uh, Role. I mean, you guys were sometimes getting, you know, bigger applause than like, you know, uh, Bob Newhart and Mary Fram were when they were walking in through the door in the first episode, uh, the first scenes of the show. Oh, yeah. I, I try not to think about it, but if it weren't there, I would notice it, you know, that I tried not to think about it, you know. Uh, and Tom Post, and uh, he liked to joke around a lot, and, and I don't even remember this, but he said, because Tony and John came out and got their own applause by themselves. And I came out and they applauded, but I made some kind of mistake. And he said, see, I told you, you got bigger applause. So he uh, he made them, that Larry or Bill Sampson made a mistake. <laughs> but uh, I like Tom a lot. He is generous, took me to a commercial agent when I didn't have one. And, it was a good bunch, a good bunch. And uh, Bob had done his old series on that same stage, and he knew a lot of the crew, and he believed in doing the show and get out and go home, but not stay until 12, 1 o'clock in the morning when the audience is so tired. So we were lucky that it was Bob. I mean, I, I'd come back in on Monday, and somebody left a razor blade in this, my dressing room. <clears throat> it wasn't locked. I didn't like that, you know. They think that's me, but I wasn't into drugs and stuff. Oof. I did like to have a drink away from the set, and so did Bob. But not at work. Well, that's what, yeah, I've read that, you know, Bob Newhart was, wasn't still as, like, a consummate professional of, like, you know, do do what you need to do and, you know, do it well. Yes, he was a, he was a wonderful boss. Yeah. Probably the smartest I ever worked for, but uh, I wouldn't mind if he'd give me 10 more shows a year, but I, I, you know, it's never enough. I was happy. I I used to tell friends, uh, I was walking down the street, and this actor had a career, I won't mention his name, but uh, I said, it's not that great being on the show, meaning I feel sorry that you don't have a show right now, and I do. And he said, made you famous, didn't it? Those were his words, not my words. So I guess it did. 
did at the time. Um, you know, like I said, you know, and I've told various family members that um, that I was interviewing you and John, like they were like, they were very like, oh my, you're interviewing Larry and other brother Daryl, like, you know, they, you know, love the show and, you know, immediately recognize you guys. So, you know, they're, um, the fan base is still out there. We were, they, they kept the show on there then and give them my thanks and uh, love and uh, I just, I just, there's a lot of luck involved, hard work, and, but I'm going to mention my book one more time and I promise not to, you can <laughs> hang up there. It's called Yes, I'm That Guy, The Rough and Tumble Life of a Character Actor, and if they're remotely interested, it shows how hard work and perseverance can pay off. All the time, being a very big danger to myself, self-doubt, self-sabotage. Thank you for letting me mention it. Again, no worries, and th thank you for coming on. <laughs> you know, we're still a sm re reasonably small um, series, so getting um, people like you on has um, been a great help to boost us up. So we're punching above our weight class, but we like it. Thank you very much for letting us And I really wish that I could have sat with John and Tony. And when I'm, you know, uh, they never minimized what I was saying by agreeing with me all the time. I'll put it that way. <laughs> and that made it fun. Made it fun. Yeah. And again, yeah, it seems like, you know, I've watched um, the blooper reels. It seems like you guys, you know, even though you were professionals and all that and did your job well, it seems like you know, it was a fun set to be on. Yeah. yeah. Oh, one fan who asked if we were real brothers. Um, that was kind of amusing. The best question I didn't, wasn't there, when, an audience member asked Bob, is this a rerun you're shooting? <laughs> yeah, I, I would love to have heard his answer, but I didn't have the nerve to say to him, what'd you say? <laughs> but Bob would warm the audience up and, and he could be a little more risque. And it's like the Queen of England scratching her rear end or something. You're not expecting it. And so they were in a good mood by the time we started. You know, because, you know, he always was known for playing, like, straight-laced, you know, kind of deadpan characters. But, you know, I mean, I encourage people, like, to seek out his stand-up material and all that. I have um, his, uh, I've got a record shop, his um, album, Button Down, uh, Mind on TV. Um, and it's, like, it, it's really hilarious, you know, for a now 50-year-old um, album. Like, it's all still great material. And it's, like, and Bob Newhart's doing this. Yeah. Well, he wrote that material, and he's so smart, and... I saw him in Pennsylvania at uh, Hershey Theater, and he was great. Uh, I, uh, I could never do that, <laughs> but uh, we were lucky to work with him. He seems like a truly um, great guy. I'd, I'd love to interview him, so if I don't know if you could put a good word in for me on him or any Oh, else. absolutely. I don't, I'm not in touch very much, but if it happens, I'll be glad to. I, I I hope you talk to him. He just, uh, uh, whenever I saw him talking and congratulating to other stars, I wish he could have. I could have learned. He knew just what to say. Always. I guess you call that manners, dignity, and he had it. But off camera, he could be pretty, pretty different, pretty wild. You know, with the jokes. But that's why Don, uh, his friend, Don Rickles, died. And they were such good friends because they, their minds were both pretty anarchistic. Which when I found that out, um, that they were like really good friends, that like blew my mind because if you told me to come up with a more comedic differing pair of um, duos just from their public personas, I would um, I would say you, know, you couldn't get much more different than Don Rickles and Bob Newhart, but you know, it's great. Yeah. I, great watching. Um, they did a roast for Rickles, the Dean Martin one. You know, Bob was there and you know, he was like really funny on that when he was roasting um, Don Rickles. Yeah. Yeah, well, he and, as you know, I'm sure they're Rickles' wife and Bob's wife. They're good friends, and they travel the world together. He tells a lot of funny stories about that. Uh, I'm sure it's recorded somewhere. They start out with home movies, and 
no film in the camera or something, Rick Olson. I don't know, uh, but they were an unusual pair. Yeah, too bad they didn't try and do like a TV series together. That would have um, been, a, they, they could have been the real odd couple. Well, yeah, Don may have done one New Heart episode. I don't think I did it with him, but uh, Rickles, I believe, it was known for he had trouble learning the lines. Lord knows when he did a live act, he just flowed out. You know, I shouldn't talk. I, from right now, the lines don't come as fast as they used to for me. I probably should quit talking because I know I, I've been not, trying not to do it over 30 minutes because who wants to hear a character actor talk about himself for 30 minutes? I mean, my fans right hopefully would, but... Um, so, okay, well, then I'll just wrap up one more question and we'll call it a day again. So, you know, going into the mind of Larry now, in the year 2020 now, what do you think Larry, Daryl, and Daryl would be doing in the midst of this pandemic that we're in the middle of? Mm. The brothers might get inventive, but uh, I, um, I imagine Larry would be in the basement somewhere. Uh, but uh, he was Larry was an innocent. William Sanderson's not an innocent, but... Uh, some people may not have thought we were funny, they thought we were weird, but he, I hope he'd be helping out a neighbor when he could. Might scare them, but uh, the nucleus or the beginning of Blair Darrell and Darrell, they were uh, humanitarians. <laughs> I don't know, man. I, 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 I'd be in the basement somewhere, come out when I could. Did that answer you? Yeah, pretty much. I I would like to see um, how Larry Daryl and Daryl might try and set up like Uber Eats to um, keep the Minuteman alive um, in the takeout world. But, you know, who knows? I can see you're going to be a great writer, and that's why I would depend on you. And uh, once once on New Heart, I didn't like this joke very much. And, and uh, this writer didn't last long, but he said, well, what have you got? And I didn't have what he, uh, I, d I didn't have a substitute ready. It was early on. I don't know. They might have been making fun of Elvis Presley. And I write a lot in the book about being around Elvis Presley when I was uh, from 11 years old to 18. And, uh, but, hey, I, I, I'm no writer. I don't know. I, thank you, though, no for uh, your time. So, yeah, again, again, thank you very much for coming on and talking with us. You know, we hope everyone enjoyed it. All right. Good luck to you. Bye-bye. Have a good day.